Hey, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Worship Service with CBC. I'm Pastor Rob. I'm so glad we can gather this way today. So we're in a series this month called Here to There, and it's about uh, God meeting us with all of our emotions, all of our challenges, all of our frustrations, everything we go through, weariness, discouragement. We're looking at Psalms, and in those Psalms, we see people just like us coming before God and how God wants to meet them in the midst of all that, the here and then to the to and to the there. And um, one of the things that is expressed in the Psalms is from shame to freedom. Pastor Brad's going to bring the message this morning. It's so important. Now, shame is a tough thing, and God wants to meet us in that. God doesn't shame us, but he wants to redeem that shame to help us understand what real freedom is all about. Because after all, we all do things, and we feel shame about things, don't we? So that's a way of just sort of getting our attention to be able to discover God's plan of forgiveness and freedom. So I'm so glad you're with us today. Now, part of, as we think about that in the message, it's also, even as we sing to Christ, words about freedom, words about a relationship with him. So I invite you to join with us as we worship Christ. Good morning. Thank you so much for joining us at CBC Online. We're excited to gather together again, wherever you're at, whoever you're with. Let's sing these songs in praise to our great and glorious God. Step out of the shadows, step out of the grave, break into the wild, and don't be afraid. Run into wide open. Of the Lord is there is freedom. 
We've been going through the Psalms, looking at these songs from thousands of years ago that contain timeless truths about who God is. And this morning we're going to sing a song that was actually written in 1876, the great hymn, Nothing But the Blood. And again, just an example of it, that God's truth remains the same over years and centuries and millennia. And the same truths that we sing today are the same truths that were being sung in 1876, the same truths that were being sung thousands of years ago through the song. So let's sing this great hymn together. And what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole? to the 
Join me, let's pray. Our God, we come before you wanting to live into those words that it's good to run to you. We need to run to you. Our lives are uh, without hope and without purpose unless we keep coming back to you and to your grace. And Lord, as we think about even just our journey the last seven days and our world's journey, we come with heavy hearts. We think about the loss of life in Beirut and the horrible explosions and um, how lives were literally shattered in a matter of seconds. And Lord, we pray for your grace and mercy on uh, the citizens of that, of that city, those, in, those impacted. Some obviously from other countries just living there. So Lord, help. Uh, may people see your love and your grace and may they run to you. Uh, Lord, keep us mindful of how you are calling us as your followers to come together in oneness and run to you. Remind us of the unity, unity that we have in you uh, Lord, give your grace to families this week. Classes are back in session. Teachers are showing up. Lord, uh, you've given wisdom as we've asked of it. And we're asking for not only continued wisdom, but grace to handle these changes with schedules, with online responsibilities, with um, just the change of what, it's, what we expect. So, Lord, we commit to you our families, our students, our education system. So, Lord, thank you that we can come before you. Thank you that you're the God who meets us here and takes us there and for all of your grace as we trust you. So I pray here for your spirit to continue to speak to each of our hearts. We ask this in the wonderful and strong name of Christ, our Savior. 
Amen and amen. Well, um, there are certainly tough things that are happening, and we see those things. And uh, even though when we talked about bumper stickers, we know that not everything may happen for a reason, but God certainly can take everything and use them for a grander purpose. And so we continue to lean into that, don't we? Uh, we need to keep trusting him and not grow weary, not give up. Uh, I want to let you know, God continues to work in our midst. Uh, last Sunday night on our Sunday evening service, we celebrated the baptism of Sophia, one of our teenagers. And to see just her faith in Christ, her choice to follow him, follow Christ in the waters of baptism was so encouraging. And we've had new small groups launch, which is just great and awesome. And so we know God continues to work. And in fact, to that end, I want to let you know, even though I know school is right in the midst of starting, a lot of things are still pivoting, um, rooted our 10-week discipleship experience will start again next month in September on the 14th. And you are invited. Uh, we had one, our, our Zoom one that was last May, it finished in, in uh, July, and it worked great. It was different, and yet it works really well. So for your own growth, as we think about running to the Father and living a life of freedom, I want to encourage you. Ask the Lord, is it time to take Rooted? And, uh, and it, it can work through Zoom this fall. So let us know about that. That'd be awesome. Now, in a moment, we're going to uh, go ahead and have a pause, and we'll have, of course, this chance to think about our own stewardship. And we're talking about, of course, this journey from shame to freedom. And I have to confess, there are times that in some of our Christian messages, we might connect giving to shame. And I hope you've not heard that from us. If so, I apologize. Our giving, our generosity should never be driven by shame or guilt or fear, but truly out of a generous heart. So again, I want to thank those of you who have been faithful in this area. And if this is a new area for you to want to be in a spiritual practice of stewardship, watch the video, go to our website, and, and discover the freedom and the joy of being an, a reoccurring online giver. We're grateful for that, and I'll be honest with you, and as a church, we depend on that. And especially now, it is harder than ever. So each person's... Uh, contribution makes a difference for the sake of the kingdom so people can hear God who he is run to him follow Jesus with all their heart so thank you very much watch this and then pastor Brad will come who sow with tears will reap with songs of joy. Those who go out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with them. Mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict, and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me, yet you desired faithfulness even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in that secret place. Cleanse me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence, or take your Holy Spirit from me. 
Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then will I teach transgressors your ways so that sinners will turn back to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God, you who are God my Savior, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. Open my lips, Lord, and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart you, God, will not despise. May it please you to prosper Zion, to build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in the sacrifices of the righteous, in the burnt offerings offered whole. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. So that, that was a reading from Psalm 51, and that's going to be our, our passage today. But uh, before we jump into it, I have a story to share with you. I had this period in my life between like six years old and 10 years old when I would go to sleep, and then I would wake up in the middle of the night for no reason. I'd just be up. And so then I would try to sneak into the living room, closing the hallway door behind me. I would go grab dish towels and uh, put them at the bottom of the door to block the light to getting into the rest of the the house, and then I would go get myself a drink, a snack, I'd go get comfy in my dad's recliner, and then I'd turn on the TV, and I'd just watch TV all night, mostly like old school cartoons. And more often than not, uh, I'd get caught, right? My parents would walk out, they'd say, hey, what are you doing? Get back into bed, like it's the middle of the night, you are not supposed to be doing this, you're supposed to be sleeping. And even in the simple act of being uh, caught watching TV when I wasn't supposed to, two powerful feelings kind of immediately rose up in my life and I, and I felt them and they were guilt and shame. Like I felt guilty about what I did. Pr- probably more accurately, I felt guilty about getting caught, but I felt guilty about what I did and I felt shame because maybe there was something wrong with me. Maybe there was something like broken inside of me. I knew I was supposed to be sleeping, but I couldn't fall asleep. I couldn't sleep through the night. So something was not right with me. Now my guess is, Those two things are things that you carry as well, guilt and shame. And maybe even in this exact moment, you're feeling the weight of them. So whether it comes from sneaking an extra cookie, cheating on a test, driving in the carpool lane when it's just you in the car, or maybe you're having an affair, but guilt and shame follow us wherever we go. And for some of us, shame is a powerful stronghold that we just can't seem to shake from our lives. And it seems to trap us. And as hard as I, I might want to, as hard as it might uh, be for you, I want you to go back mentally to some of those moments, some of those places in your life where you felt an overwhelming sense of shame. Maybe it's where guilt and shame have crisscrossed and overlapped with each other. And, and I understand that maybe the weight is heavy, almost unbearable. But as we sit in the midst of remembering some of those moments of guilt and shame, I need you to hear something vital, something that's super important, that God does not want you to stay stuck there. God does not want you to stay stuck in your guilt and in your shame. In fact, God desires freedom for you. I don't know if you've ever heard that before, but God desires freedom for you, freedom from shame, freedom from guilt. God wants you to breathe fresh air into your lungs. And we know guilt and shame are powerful, life-altering elements that exist in our lives. But for our conversation today, we also have to make a distinction between the two, because there is a difference. When you think about guilt, now churches don't necessarily use the word guilt very often. We more often use the word conviction. It's like, I lied, I got caught, or someone told me I've been lying, so now I feel convicted, therefore I won't do this again. I see see that it's bad. I won't do it again. And guilt or conviction is something that God can use to bring about change in our lives. Guilt helps us recognize where we've done something wrong. Now, shame is a little different. Shame is something that we typically feel internally, right? We feel it internally. Like shame is a result of living in a broken and sinful world. Shame can come from other people. Right? Like shame is what we use to exert our power and our influence and our authority other, uh, over other people to keep them minimalized, to keep them uh, 
down and out. Shame tells us there's something wrong within us that can never be fixed, that can, be never, that can never be changed. Shame tells us that we're not worthy. Shame tells us that we're not good enough. But when we look at the God of Scripture, what we see is a God who doesn't shame people. He wants to give freedom to people from their shame. God doesn't want us to live in our guilt and our shame. He wants to bring transformation. He wants to bring healing. He wants to bring freedom to our lives. And that should be something that gets us excited. And this is why I love the series that we're in, Here to There. Because the reality is we live in the two most of the time, of the here to there. Right? Like life isn't linear. Life isn't static. It's, it's more fluid than that. And our passage, Psalm 51, gives us or helps give us great tools to not let shame win in our lives, to not let shame trap us where we're at. And so to help us understand Psalm 51, we need to know that it was written by King David, and we have to understand the reason why it was written. And so to do that, we go back to 2 Samuel chapter 11 and chapter 12. And, and, and here's kind of a summary of, of those two chapters that one hot spring day is spring was a time when, when armies and kings would go off to war, but David stayed home. And so it was a hot day. So he goes to the roof of his palace to probably cool off and he's walking around. And all of a sudden there's a woman on another roof that catches his eye. Her name is Bathsheba. Now, Bathsheba was taking a bath, probably trying to cool off, but clearly she was not clothed. And so that caught David's eye. And so then David figures out who she is. And he knows the family. He knows Bathsheba. He, he knows that her husband is Uriah, who's off in the war fighting battles for him. But David really wanted to meet Bathsheba, so he sends for her to come to the palace. And I don't know if, if he like seduced her or if it was more of him taking advantage of his authority and uh, his position. But ultimately, they have sex. Ultimately, they uh, commit an act. And so when he was done, he sent her off on her way. Here's the problem. She got pregnant. And now David has this choice. I can either come clean about this or I can try to cover it up. And so David hatches a plan. He gets Uriah from the battle, uh, from, from the front lines of the war, and he brings him back home. And he says, look, you've earned some, some rest. Now why don't you go hang out with your wife, thinking that Uriah is going to sleep with his wife. And then the pregnancy is covered and he's in the clear. But Uriah says, no, I can't sleep with her while my men are out there fighting the battle. So now David's like, oh man, what do I do? You know what? I've got a plan. I'm going to send him back to the front lines and I've got a plan to have him be abandoned in the middle of a battle and it works and Uriah is killed. And so then David says, okay, I'm going to move Bathsheba into the palace. I'm going to marry her. And eventually the baby was born and David thinks that he got away with it. He thinks he's in the clear. It's all good. Nobody knows except for he and Bathsheba. Now then a little bit after the baby was born, God sends the prophet Nathan to David. And so Nathan shares this story about this rich shepherd who steals a lamb from a poor shepherd. And so David, as a former shepherd, is, is mad. He's disgusted by this. He's like, who is this rich man? He needs to pay for his crimes. It is death for him. And Nathan tells David, guess what? You're the rich man. You're the one who stole the lamb from the poor man. And so now David is reeling. He's feeling the weight of guilt and shame for his actions. And so David responds by saying, man, I have sinned against the Lord. But we serve a gracious God. God forgives David, but there were consequences for his actions. And through Nathan, God got David's attention. He was aware of his guilt. He was aware of the shame and he know, and David knew he needed God's help. And at some point after this time, David writes Psalm 51, our text for today. And what David does in Psalm 51, he shows us how we get from here, trapped by shame, to there, 
set free from our shame. And so what we see in the first two verses of Psalm 51 is David still has this plea of forgiveness. Have mercy on me according to your unfailing love, according to your compassion. Cleanse me from my sin. I mean, David starts with asking for forgiveness. And then in verses three through six, David does something incredible. He, did, he confesses. He's like, you know the transgressions I have had against you, Lord. You know that I have sinned. Now, I believe that confession is one of the most powerful tools in our arsenals as, follower, as followers of Jesus. That when confession is done in its proper place and time, it could make the difference between being trapped in our shame or conviction that leads us to freedom a freedom that God desires for us. And after David's confession, what does he do? He asks to be clean, to be cleansed. He says, cleanse me with your hyssop, which is just like a really leafy plant. And they would use that to sprinkle blood or water on the person uh, to be ceremonially cleansed. And so David understood that it is God who removes our sin. David understood that it's God who creates a pure heart. David understands that it's God's spirit within us, empowering us to be sustained by that power, to live in freedom and not be trapped by our shame. That is the path that breaks us from shame to conviction, from conviction to freedom. So David asked for forgiveness, he confessed, and he was cleansed. Three distinct steps. Now, most of the time, I feel like we try to cut the corners. At least, I I may not be speaking for you. I I am for sure speaking for me. I try to cut the corners. I say sorry for something I did wrong, but I don't really ask for forgiveness. Or maybe I ask for forgiveness, but I don't really confess as to why I'm asking for forgiveness. And I hated saying sorry as a kid because I had to admit that I did something wrong. But cutting corners does not help us experience freedom. Cutting corners stops us from stepping into the freedom God has called us to. See, David took time to ask for forgiveness, to confess, and to be cleansed. He, and then he turns this corner. What we see in verses 10 through 17 that I'm gonna read here in a second, I mean, we see a man whose heart burns with fire for the Lord. This is what verses 10 through 17 says. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore me to the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressors your ways so that sinners will turn back to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God, You who are God, my Savior, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. Open my lips, Lord, and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not delight in sacrifice or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. You, God, will not despise. I mean, these are the words of a man who will not allow shame to trap him. Shame unchecked in our lives can leak into a lot of areas. And I know most of you have probably experienced or felt that. It can cause, shame can cause anxiety, feelings of unworth, depression, self-esteem issues. It can cause us to feel stuck because we believe the lie that I'm not good enough. I will never measure up. I can never figure this out. I'm always worth less. It can create such toxicity in our lives that we intentionally destroy relationships around us, that we intentionally implode. But listen, God did not create you for a less than existence. God created you with intention, with meaning and purpose. And you will have a hard time stepping into the adventure that God has dreamed for your life without the freedom that he wants you to possess within it. And I think the biggest lesson we learn from David's story in this psalm 
is that if we want to break away from shame and step into freedom, we know that this is first and foremost a spiritual issue. It is a spiritual battle. For David, the difference between being shamed and trapped versus convicted and then freed, his first step was to go to God. He went to God. And then he asked for forgiveness. He confessed and he desired to be cleansed. And then the second step that David did is that he remained in God's presence until he gave him a life-altering experience with grace. That makes all the difference. Experiencing the true grace of God is the key to being released from our shame that holds us down. Grace, by definition, is something that we don't deserve. But God's grace fills in the gap where we're not good enough, where we feel like we don't measure up. It was God's grace that propelled David forward into freedom. And yet, a lot of us know that up here in our minds. And yet it's so hard to live out. We still allow shame to trap us from becoming healthy emotionally and spiritually. It keeps us in our cycle of adultery or pornography, in broken relationships, codependency, substance abuse, chasing materialism, work addiction, neglect, or spiritual apathy. Whatever it is that shame keeps us going back to, we dive right into it. And when we look at David and those that have a not allowed shame to win, as opposed to those of us who can't seem to break free from shame, I think the difference is that David knows that he is God. No, or no one, that David knows that he is God's. He's God's child, that he's loved by God. He has worth given to him by God. He is value because God has declared it. David knows that. And I think that's what made the difference. So otherwise, how could a man who has killed, committed adultery, theft, idolatry, you name it, how could a man who is engaged in that at the end of his life still be considered a man after God's own heart? That's what David is described as. He's a man after God's own heart. He wasn't called that because he was perfect or virtuous. He was called that because he turned to God no matter what the situation was that was circling him. He turned to God no matter what it was that he did or caused or that something that happened to him. He turned to God. Even when it was his own sin that got in the way. That's the difference maker. He turned to God. And it's the same for you. It's the same for me. You are a child of God. That means that God loves you. That God is fighting for you. He wants you to step into your purpose to, with freedom, no longer trapped by our shame. And for some of us, periodically going back to Psalm 51 and experiencing freedom from our shame is going to be all we need. But for others, shame is more complex and it's a deeper stronghold in our life. Now, I'll be honest with you, shame isn't necessarily a stronghold in my life. I've experienced it, but, but it's not something that traps me. But I can tell you right now that my stronghold is anger. And I know that Jesus saves me. I know that it's Jesus that gives me freedom from my anger. But there are times in my life where, I, where the anger is so deep. It runs so deep. It has such a stronghold that even though I know that it's Jesus that sets me free, I need a little outside help. Just like Nathan helped David. And so I need a little outside help to process my anger. And so pretty consistently since I was about 12 or 13 years old, I have seen a Christian therapist to help me in my anger. I've been, uh, you know, m maybe if it's shame for you, here's a moment, here's a chance where you can make an appointment with a Christian therapist that can help you process some of this stuff. Yes, it's Jesus that saves you. Yes, it's Jesus that gives you freedom. But maybe there's a Nathan in your life. 
And if it's not a Christian therapist, maybe just a trusted friend, someone that can go to you and, and, and be vulnerable. You can be vulnerable with, and you can be open with, and yet they're gonna hold you accountable with empathy and love. If you need extra help, CBC is here. We have a list of Christian therapists in the area with different focuses and expertise and probably price range. And we would love to help you on your journey to find freedom from shame. And so if you want access to that, I would say email us at prayer at findcommunity.com and in the subject or in the body of the email, just type in help, help. And we'll know what that means. That's code for, I need some extra help. Something has trapped me right where I'm at. And I need Jesus and maybe just someone else's empathy and accountability to help me. We would love to help you in your journey to find freedom from shame. And lastly, as a church family, we have a responsibility to create a no shame culture right here at CBC right here in our church. For those of us that are here now and for those that are gonna come, our world has enough brokenness in it. Our churches should be working hard to be a no shame zone. I'm reminded of Ephesians chapter four, verse 32. And I, I'm thinking about it from the, the message translation, which says, be gentle with one another, sensitive. Forgive one another as quickly and as thoroughly as God in Christ forgave you. Man, what a powerful statement. Work quickly to forgive one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. We have an awesome responsibility in front of us. And if God can give us freedom and grace in our lives, then we better be willing to extend it to somebody else. Our churches should be no shame zones and you know what like cbc like there have been moments where we have done this well there have been places where we've done this well but there's always room to grow there's always an opportunity to get better to be more active at it church is supposed to be the difference maker in our world followers of christ are supposed to be the difference maker in our world. And so I hope you'll join me as active agents of the gospel, bringing Jesus to who's broken, to who's trapped in their shame, that we partner with God to help them be rescued because God wants us to experience freedom in our lives. Would you join me in a moment of prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, we know that you desire freedom for us. But I'll be honest, Lord, sometimes shame traps us really bad. Sometimes it's hard to move. It's hard to know. Sometimes I, I don't know what way is up and what way is down because the shame is just so unbearable. But Lord, I do know that you desire freedom for us. So I pray for those of us that are trapped in it, that our first step is to look to you, to ask for forgiveness, to confess, to be cleansed by you, Lord. And then, Lord, I pray that what we experience is your life-changing grace, that that's the thing that unlocks the chains in our lives of, sh of shame. Lord, we know that you love us. We know that you are fighting for us. So I pray for us as a church to join you in that. To be a people, a church family that brings healing and love and no shame. Just you. Let us be a people that brings just you. It's in Christ's name. Amen. Well, thank you, Pastor Brad, uh, for bringing us back to God's word and those encouraging words that David writes in Psalm 51 to take us from shame to freedom, to, to re-experience God's grace again in our lives every day and even that renewed joy of our salvation. I'm, I'm so glad we could have today together. And I want to remind you, if you're newer here, we'd love to get to know you. If you go to our website, slash connect is a way to let, just 
say I'm here and, and we could just start a conversation. Remember Linktree is where all the stuff is connected there in terms of events and signups. So uh, be sure you check out Linktree. And then finally for parents with kids, uh, the kids space video is up. So let, and even if you don't have kids, maybe there's someone else, some neighborhood, some friend you can just send the link to to help our kids discover the goodness and grace of Christ. So that is really important for all of us, isn't it? And um, so then next week, we'll have our last message in the book of Psalms, and I look forward for us being together. As we leave today, I want to read a verse from Psalm 143. It's just our benediction, our reminder of the goodness of Christ. When, he says, when the scripture says, Let the morning bring me word of your unfailing love, for I have put my trust in you. Show me the way I should go, for to you I entrust my life. May you sense God's goodness and love every morning. May you continue to put your full trust in him uh, in this new week ahead. God bless you. We'll see you all.